who is President George Herbert Walker Bush. Good evening, I'm Idal Howland. Welcome to... He was born into a privileged family, served his country in the Navy, was shot down in combat over the Pacific and served as the United States 41st president. In the New York Times number one bestseller, Destiny and Power, the American Odyssey of George Herbert Walker Bush, Pulitzer Prize winning author John Meacham drawing from President Bush's personal diaries, the diaries of his wife Barbara and interviews, paints an intimate portrait of our nation's former leader. So tonight we ask, who is the real President George Herbert Walker Bush? And to answer that, we are very pleased to welcome Pulitzer Prize winner and the author himself, John Meacham. As always, leading our discussion, our hosts, David Jones and Gary Poland. Well, uh, we're really excited to have you back, John. Thanks. And obviously, you're a brilliant writer, and uh, people will, would, could find, I guess, a lot of things that would be less fulfilling than spending time reading your books. Not well, only this book, but and your earlier books. And you've books. escaped the 18th century. That's good. Yeah, but it's Briefly, but I'm, I'm hurtling back to it as soon as possible. <laughs> and we're going to make it. And we're going to make it a musical. That's right. Uh, that's right. One of the things I, I'm going to wrap my That's answer. where the real money is coming. <laughs> yeah, I know. You, believe the me. Believe me. I know. Uh, one of the things that I, that I was impressed about your book is, is, you know, we're just finishing a political season. It's yep. been probably unique in American history as yep. far as modern history. And you, you, you talked about Bush being, it appears to be the last patrician. And you, and you said that as a compliment. Mm -hmm. So wh why is it today in, in, in American politics that George Herbert Walker Bush is the last patrician? Well, you know, he was... Uh, in a tectonic shift even as president, uh, as you all know. Uh, he was almost a relic in real time. Uh, born in 1924, Greenwich Country Day School, Andover, Yale, on his 18th birthday, he graduated from high school, turned 18, and signs up for the Navy. Uh, he tried to go to the Royal Canadian Air Force right after Pearl Harbor. That's back when he went to Canada to fight wars uh, as opposed to avoid them. <laughs> um, but things were shifting uh, when he was president. Uh, there was the rise of confessional politics. You know, Bill, one of the ironies is Bill Clinton said, I feel your pain. George Bush did too. He just didn't think it was a president's job to show it. And so, as you all know, um, he's one of the most emotional of men. But he thought that a president had a certain dignity that had to be maintained in the public square. Uh, the media environment has changed radically. Uh, you know, in the early 1980s, CNN comes along, Crossfire comes along. Uh, you all may be somewhat familiar with that format. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and the idea that there's one view from the left, one view from the right, you know, he, that was his political ethos as he was vice president and president. But he was always essentially a moderate conservative Republican. Uh, really had more in common with Gerald Ford and Dwight Eisenhower than he did with Ronald Reagan or his own son, politically. And, and in fact, Reagan did not want him as vice president. No. And so my, my question to you is this. Um, uh, what happened to the voodoo economics ob objection? What happened to the first time in four decades that the Republican platform did not endorse the ERA and came out with a pro-life constitutional amendment and does it all prove that George W. Bush would abandon any principle H for H advancement? No, it does not prove that uh, by any means. Uh, he was a man who made compromises on the road to amassing power. What I think redeems him uh, and makes him totally fascinating, particularly in this era, is that he, on several occasions, he made real-time decisions that cost him political capital. Uh, Chiefly, he said, read my lips, no new taxes. But when he came to believe that the national interest required a budget deal that raised taxes, he did it. And he said, I thought I would be dead meat. You know, he, it was not a, that's a, a classic George Bush phrase. Uh, he was totally aware that he was, he was risking his reelection uh, doing that. And when he was the seventh district's congressman in, uh, in 1968, he votes for fair housing. Right. And in 1964, he had opposed the Civil Rights Act when he ran against Ralph Yarborough the first time. Uh, that's a tough thing to talk about now. But when he had power in 68, he votes for fair housing. Right. He comes down here to Memorial High School. There's a ferocious meeting of constituents. He quotes Edmund Burke saying, sometimes a representative owes you a reflection of your will, and sometimes he owes you his best judgment. And my best judgment is we cannot send African Americans to fight in Vietnam and then say they can't buy real estate in certain neighborhoods. So was he craven uh, in 1964 by opposing the act and the search for power? Uh, perhaps, but once he had it, he was willing to expend it. And we're talking about a politician here. We're not talking about a philosopher. We're not talking about a pastor. We're talking about someone who made his life in the arena.
Mm. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting, the, 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 the virtues that you talked about that uh, President Bush had as a politician in an office seem to be absent uh, today in politics. And I was going to mention a few of them sure. and kind of get your take on why they've disappeared. Uh, dignity, pretty much gone. Yeah, it was, it's a reality TV era. Um, it's almost as though the 2016 election was, if Washington's going to act like a reality show, we'll just send you a reality <laughs> show star. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to imagine uh, someone with Bush's essential reticence about his emotions uh, and essential grace, uh, not to say he's perfect, you know, he was a tough competitor, uh, but this is a man who once walked into a uh, children's leukemia ward in Poland, and he and Mrs. Bush had lost a daughter to leukemia 35 years before, and he, be he realizes where he is, and he begins to cry, and reporters and th the cameras are all behind him, mm -hmm. and he won't turn around, because if he turns around, the story becomes about him and not about the kids. I know a lot of politicians. I admire them. Uh, they go into the arena. It's the only way we have to conduct our public business. I don't know many of them, except for George Herbert Walker Bush, who would not have turned around. Who have you seen cry in public? Who haven't we? Well, right now we're all crying. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's an easier answer. All right, let me ask you this. See, these are the four major accomplishments that I recall from your book in, uh, in the Bush administration. Yeah. And please add to it or subtract from it. One is the Americans for Disabilities Act. Yep. Uh, the second one was when he raised taxes to attack the deficit, which ended up being a, a magnificent success. Right. Uh, the third was his Cold War diplomacy during the time of the Gorbachev era. And finally, uh, when he got rid of Saddam without going to Baghdad. Right. And the Clean Air Act, which is still functionally our environmental policy, um, I think that is a good summary of his, of his presidency. Uh, managing the end of the Cold War is something that you know the historical and political market tends not to give you enough credit for problems averted. And that really kind of defines President Bush in many ways. Um, and I think it goes to a, a virtue question. There's a direct line in my mind from George Bush's essential empathy. He was known as half-half Bush as a kid because he would cut a treat, a cookie or a candy bar in half and give half to the other kid. Um, there's a direct line between that empathetic nature and the way he dealt with Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, in November 1989, the Berlin Wall falls. He's under pressure from Democrats and the press to go to Berlin to declare victory. He doesn't do it. He gives up a, a wonderful opportunity to score political points because he knows that Gorbachev has a complicated process he's in the middle of. And there were a lot of bitter ender communists, a lot of Soviet uh, people. We now see they're still uh, <laughs> moderate <laughs> right. stars. That's, yeah. That's, you know, there was a, we didn't call it Putinism then, but it was there. Um, and he knew that Gorbachev needed some breathing room. And so he gave it to him. And that's a case where, you know, my own view of presidents, of all of us, is that character is destiny. And his character, Bush's character, was really almost had more in common with the founding fathers than it does with the current generation of politicians. Yeah, which makes him, of course, a very special leader for the country. Uh, how about the politics? Uh, one, yeah. of the th one of the, the most compelling things I find, uh, I took my children to the Bush Library at Texas A&M, <coughs> and you, you go through the exhibit, and of course you have the exhibit about the, the, the Gulf War, and you, you look what his ratings are, and his approval ratings in the 90s. Yep. They ni over 90% of the American people approved of Bush, and 18 months later, He's on the ash heap of history. He's out. He's lost to this 37%. sleazy governor from Arkansas. Right. Uh, so how did, how did, I mean, you have to, and I'm sure the president told you or talked about it or in his diaries, he had to wonder, how did this happen to me? Well, you know, it's funny because he, there are a couple of moments where Bush was actually ahead of his advisors, ahead of folks. Uh, one was in 88. Uh, he knew early on that uh, portraying Dukakis as a hopeless liberal was going to be the way to go. This pops up in the diary and at the first mention of Dukakis coming through the 88 primaries. The other is in March of 1991, at the end of the Gulf War, he says, I, these numbers are artificial, they won't stick, and there's going to be a tough uh, economic sledding ahead. And I, I hope, 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 is, I think the phrase was, I hope, 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 it'll be a soft recession. Um, he had been up and down so much. Um, you know, he had 
lost two Senate races down here, uh, had, um, you know, we now look back at his resume as this kind of charmed march of public service. But each of those jobs was a close run thing, as Wellington said of Waterloo. Um, he was always kind of fighting his way up the ladder. He loses in 88. Hell, he doesn't carry Texas until the 88 primaries right. statewide. Um, so he was someone who had a tough, uh, a tough go of it. And I think ultimately uh, is a model uh, for endurance. Uh, he wanted to, uh, desperately wanted to be reelected, uh, but he also had some health issues. Uh, he had Graves' disease, a thyroid condition uh, that they never really got right. It's very hard to govern that. Almost no one, no one I talked to uh, believed that he was the same man fully in the last two years of the presidency that he had been in the first two years. You and I mm. both were at the Republican con Convention of 1992, recall? That's correct. Uh, that was the No New Texas Convention. That's right. You heard that. I, I did. Live. And uh, what I, <laughs> That's right. That was also the convention where somebody remarked that Pat Buchanan's speech read better in the original German. Uh, that's right. Yeah, that's we heard exactly Buchanan, right. too. Yeah. He, was, he uh, was something. Yeah. What, what, what I read in your book about the uh, you know, run-up to um, that convention was the negotiations with the two Democratic uh, con with the Democratic Congress, Senate yep. and, and House, <coughs> um, and that this would this would be necessary. And 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 Darman, I think, came up. His uh, budget director, I believe, came up with a revenue enhancement phrase or something like that. Revenue, yeah. you know, yeah. it's something to disguise it right. in, in some ways. Uh, but quickly, uh, Gingrich found out about it and said it was a betrayal of Reaganism. So my question to you is, uh, extrapolating from the betrayal language of yeah. Gingrich. Number two questions. How did they get along after that? Uh, did it not lead to his defeat in the uh, yeah. because of Buchanan? And thirdly, is this betrayal language something that we're living with today? Unquestionably. I mean, there's in some ways the Tea Party, in some ways the Trumpian populism can be traced back 25 years to, to this moment. The right had never trusted Bush. Uh, again, he'd lost down here uh, at a point when the party was very, very conservative, as because I know it's so moderate now. Uh, <laughs> and, um, but he had um, he had been seen as a centrist. He was seen as a carpetbagger. You know, grown up in Connecticut, gone to Yale. He'd been here since '48. Uh, you know, when he moved to Odessa, uh, Mrs. Bush's mother in Rye, New York. Uh, would send her daughter boxes of laundry detergent and soap because she didn't think they had any uh, in <laughs> Odessa. Um, but what he did was uh, try uh, again and again to uh, appease the right, move ahead, breaking the pledge in 1990, mm -hmm. uh, June of the last week of June 1990, confirmed the base's fears about him. And the, they, they hadn't wanted him, you mentioned it, Reagan had not wanted him on the ticket because he was seen as sort of the last Rockefeller Republican. Reagan was the conservative avatar. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's interesting, there were still enough moderate Republicans in 1980 that the two people who Reagan considered for vice president were former President Ford and then ultimately George Bush. You didn't say who, who persuaded him to, to, to give uh, Bush his shot. As vice president? Yeah. Uh, he, it was Reagan himself because, you know, in 76, when Reagan had almost beaten Ford uh, in Kansas City, Reagan, nobody, almost nobody remembers this, Reagan had named his running mate beforehand, right. Schweiker. Richard, Richard Schweiker of Pennsylvania. This is the dorkiest table in Texas right here. Uh, <laughs> and so, um, you know, I hope, I hope that drives your ratings. Um, so, but, but because Reagan believed he needed a moderate, and right. Pennsylvania was, you know, uh, was the, a moderate state. So Bill Scranton, Thornburg, ultimately all that. Uh, and so when the, when the break came, in, uh, in 1990, I think of the moment when Gingrich walks out the front door of the White House and Bush goes out to the Rose Garden with the leadership. There, CNN did a split screen of the two moments. That is a reflexive partisanship's O.J. Bronco chase moment because Gingrich at that point had committed to the pursuit of a House majority and a pure base as opposed to supporting a president of his own party. Which is fascinating. And that's what we're living with. Well, no, that's true. Now, uh, George W. Bush, of course, succeeds his father eight years later. Right. And I wondered what your take was on 
whether or not the, the I guess, the, the revitalization or the resurgence of the George Herbert Walker Bush image among the American people had come back up after eight years of Clintonism, yeah. that it set the table for his son and with the same name to be elected. I mean, we always want what we don't have, right? Uh, in American politics. Uh, so, for instance, just to pick an example at random, we've gone from a uh, University of Chicago, Harvard-trained law professor to Donald Trump. Um, hard to imagine a, a farther journey one could make on the spectrum. Um, Bill, Bill Clinton's scandals, Bill Clinton's uh, ungoverned appetites uh, did lead to a nostalgia for, for George H.W. Bush almost instantly. Uh, the moment, you know, he, he left with a pretty good approval rating, uh, actually left in January of 1993. Um, George W. Bush, you know, got this, uh, you know, he was running as a particular conservative, he was running as his own man, uh, and I think it's unquestionable that the affection for his father helped, but, uh, but I don't think it was determinative in, in George W. Bush's rise. Uh, there is a, a chapter... Uh, but it, it actually is through three chapters, as I recall, uh, from 1985 through um, 1990, uh, 1992, which is basically when <coughs> he uh, pardoned Weinberger, Abrams, oh, yeah. and um, uh, one other one other um, participant yeah. in yeah. the uh, Iran Contra affair, yeah. and. Uh, I, I have not read that you have been soft on Bush in in terms of anything. Right. Okay. Uh, what I'm asking you uh, though is whether or not um, he did his best to dodge what uh, George Shultz said. Uh, he obviously yeah. knew what Weinberger said. Uh, why is he doing this? Mm -hmm. He was there. Yeah. Um, and uh, how he how he how he got out of that. He, he, in fact, called it, they are thinking this is going to be a Watergate syndrome. Exactly. Uh, he did not tell the truth once, on, very early on. Um, in fact, the day the story broke, uh, he, he told a reporter from a local, I think, Chicago TV station, he said, it's crazy to say we sold arms to Iran. Now, did he mean that it was a quid pro quo? Unclear. But it, very quickly it broke, very quickly it developed in the first couple of days of that epical month, really, of November 1986, when the presidential campaign begins, uh, the Republicans lose the Senate, uh, Iran-Contra begins. I mean, it's a pretty big, a pretty momentous uh, couple of weeks. Um, he began, he, be, he set out on what could have been a dangerous path. And George Shultz goes to see him. Secretary of State, takes his wife with him. They go to the vice presidential residence. Uh, Schultz says, you were there, you, you heard the debates, you can't say this. And Jim Baker later told Schultz that he thought that uh, Baker, that Baker thought that Schultz might have saved Bush's career by pushing him on that. Um, Iran, the Iran deal was a policy argument in which Reagan and Bush were wrong and Schultz and Cap Weinberger were right. And uh, it dogged him all the way through uh, the 88 uh, primaries. It became less of an issue with, with Dukakis. Uh, and then in 1992, Jim Baker thinks, uh, and he was looking at the tracking polls, you know, the race was tightening the last weekend. This sounds familiar too, doesn't it? Uh, the October surprise. The October yeah. surprise. There was one. And then Judge Walsh, the Iran Contra prosecutor, re indicts Cap Weinberger on the Friday before the 92 election. So, and at that point, the numbers break back. So it was with him forever. Uh, Call me by, his, by any chance, was it trained by Walsh? <laughs> well, as Mark Twain once said, history may not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. <laughs> Fascinating. So, uh, you're, gonna, you're, you're in town, right? Uh, you're going to see the president? Okay. Going to see the president in a little while, yes. Good. Looking forward to that. Um, 92 years old, and uh, big news story this week. Uh, you know, the, yeah. Tr Trump appears in the, in the vice presidential diary once. Really? Uh, he and Lee Atwater, Trump and Lee Atwater, had had conversations. Uh, and Atwater, Bush's 88 advisor, went to Bush and said that Trump was willing to be considered for vice president in 1988. 
and uh, President, Vice President Bush then in his diary said, strange, unbelievable. Uh, right. And so I'm, I suspect he still has He's going to probably say that Yeah, too, exactly. Yeah, so uh, so did, did you end up being disappointed whenever uh, a man that you respected so much uh, uh, did not come openly out, especially as far as Trump is concerned, uh, a guy who had trashed his one of his favorite sons, yeah. uh, that he did not come out and say any more against Trump during the primary. Um, I think the Bushes handled this about as well as, as they could. Um, because if they had been more vocal, first of all, their silence spoke volumes. There was nobody who was going to be influenced by their opinion who didn't understand where they stood. Um, they, I think, this is my speculation, uh, I think they were concerned not to look as though they were they were being poor sports because of Jeb Bush's right. uh, uh, primary performance, and I think as President Bush Senior has uh, sort of signaled, you know, the American people can make up their own minds, and um, and President Bush, both presidents, presidents Bush, uh, called Trump. To, to called Trump right after the election. Uh, there's been a kind of ritual grace about this. And what we can hope for, it seems to me, is that uh, somehow or another, uh, as Bismarck is reputed to have said, God loves drunks, little children in the United States of America. So. And so maybe there's there's some, some hope here. Okay, how about the relationship between uh, President Bush and Barbara? Oh. How much influence did she politically she's one of the she great women him. one of the great women in American history Barbara Bush uh, I just um, I can't say enough about her she very generously let me read her diary which she has kept faithfully from 1948 until this morning wow. is that a PG-13 uh, diary uh, I notch it up a little bit you know? <laughs> uh, and she's just um, has this sense this, this great code of she she knows she's had a great life and she chooses not to complain about anything and to press forward um, and I appreciate that on a personal level also uh, d you know did she have a great deal of influence um, he, President Bush I think he told me he said you know she's very she will not say things when he was president she would not say things around the staff because when first ladies do that it gets disproportionate and then as he put it <laughs> he said Around me, she wasn't that quiet. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so you know, she uh, she has an enormous number of opinions. Uh, some of us have sometimes joked that if we could just put her on cable access, we could all retire on the proceeds. <laughs> right. Uh, but I, I think she she served the country with extraordinary uh, grace and and dignity and um, beloved figure. Um, my sense of of her contribution is that of someone who was a terrific sport. I mean, to have gone from being, President Bush told me this, you know, to be a ride, a debutante from Rye, New York, and move to Odessa and live in a uh, duplex with two prostitutes in next door. That's where they started their married lives. Um, something like 40 moves through the years. Um, you know, she managed, she was the drill sergeant. You know, she managed the operation that enabled him to be the business and political success he was. The other thing is, you know, they, we mentioned they lost their daughter Robin in 1953. And tragically, as, as you all probably know, when couples lose children, there's often such strain in the marriage that uh, sometimes the marriages don't make it. The Bush's marriage actually became stronger, uh, partly because she was strong when he was not, and vice versa. When in the last days of Robin's treatment, the George Bush couldn't stand to see his daughter be getting shots and things, so he would run out of the room, and Mrs. Bush would always be there. And then after she died, Mrs. Bush would dissolve in tears all night. And it was George Bush, as she recalls, who held her and, and got her through it. And so it, it's, it's, a, it's a tender, important, uh, complicated, and, and strong marriage. Here's a quickie for you for, for the last 45 seconds. In 2003, we had Brent Scrocroft uh, writing an op-ed uh, yeah. saying uh, going to war in Iraq was a, would be a mistake. Uh, it, was, it was perceived to be a message from George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, father of the son. Uh, do you believe it was? 
and do you believe that they were as separate from each other as they are trying to tell us they were? I, I think if George H.W. Bush had wanted to tell his son a question, uh, answers his uh, son's issue about war and peace, he would have picked up the phone. Uh, they did have conversations about it. Uh, President Bush, 41, wrote his son a note saying he'd made the right decision. Uh, I think President Bush Sr. had anxieties about the war, as one would. Time's up, John. Sorry. But he, but Thank he, you. But he put them aside. Thank you so he much. Put them aside. Yeah. Mm. Uh, a great interview, Adele. We learned a lot, and I, you know, we kind of wonder: is there a is there a class act like George Herbert Walker Bush out there for America at some point in the future? We don't know. It's a good question. Remember, you can catch Red, White, and Blue every Friday at 7.30 p.m. here on TV8. And again, Saturdays at 6.30 p.m. We also invite you to visit us online and send us your comments. We want to hear what you have to say about the issues that affect Houston. You can submit your comments at HoustonPublicMedia.org on Facebook and on Twitter at RWB underscore 8. And don't forget to like us. Thanks so much for watching. Good night.